Hi all. So I wanted to speak a bit about a controversial topic that uh, me and our team have been in the weeds around for years, uh, which is meat eating versus veganism. And I will suggest that this may be a false dichotomy uh, because in my experience and what I have always stood by is that I am in no position to proselytize about the ethics of uh, relating to sentient beings for your nutrition. Uh, all that I've ever intended to represent, uh, which I can go into a little bit, is the role of certain dietary types for certain seeming uh, symptoms and ailments and to put forth the outcomes to validate and verify that. Uh, what I do understand is that nutrition is a deeply, deeply spiritual journey. And naturally, it can begin in one place and progress and evolve and transform over time to where you find yourself somewhere you may have never expected to be. And I'll just speak a little bit to, you know, my personal journey is that I was uh, a very righteous feminist um, and militant. Uh, perhaps in my energy and also a kind of holier than thou uh, vegetarian eating pizza and Pepsi uh, drinking Pepsi uh, before I conceived my first pregnancy and it was at that time that I began eating meat again and of course I was eating like fast food burgers literally because my food awakening didn't begin until about nine months postpartum, unfortunately. Thankfully, my pharmaceutical awakening began well before that um, to usher me into a, a natural birth and um, pharmaceutically free uh, family life. However, when I uh, was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, I uh, was recommended a gluten and dairy free diet by a naturopath that I was working with and I began to understand that there is a consciousness that I can begin to bring to my food sourcing and began to order uh, you know, different products from local farms, et cetera. A fast forward you know, a couple of years and I developed um, more formally the Vital Mind Reset Protocol uh, because I found that not only in my case, but in the case of so many of my colleagues and so many of my patients, the inclusion of animal foods and specifically of red meat seemed essential and also to unlock a kind of secret craving. Nick Gonzalez came on the scene um, several years later and he validated what I had witnessed, which is that people want to eat the diet that heals them. What he also suggested is that there are you know, 12 dietary types based on the ecological adaptations that the autonomic nervous system makes to different places on the earth, you know, from the, uh, you know, Eskimos eating mostly meat and fat to the Amazonians eating mostly plants. There are, you know, different climates, different foods available, and that the nervous system over time adapts to that with either a parasympathetic or sympathetic dominance. And what he helped me to see is that most, if not all of my patients, uh, our parasympathetic dominance, which is something I've written and, and spoke about and go into more in, in BMR, and that they require for healing a highly acidic diet that is inclusive of red meat and even fatty red meat several times a day. And that there's only so far that they can get to in terms of balancing their autonomic nervous system, which of course guides their glandular secretions and in immunity, etc., cetera, uh, without that inclusion. And that made a lot of sense to me because by this time I was already publishing literally history making outcomes um, and seeing so called miracle cures come out of uh, Vital Mind Reset in my practice uh, and not just in psychiatry, right? So in autoimmune conditions, in asthma, in migraines, and in uh, bowel disease. And I knew that there was something to this. However, how much of it is eliminating the gluten, eliminating the sugar, eliminating the dairy, resolving addictive patterns, how much of it is mindset, how much of it is detox, how much of it is the specifics of the diet, other than that many of the uh, folks that 
uh, find my work um, are identified already as vegetarians or vegans. And that's something that I noted. And so, you know, we would field many comments about the vegetarian or vegan version of VMR and how they could continue on that path, but still access these tools. And we just didn't have that data, you know, because we only know what we've been doing. So I've tried to make sense of the fact um, that I have intuitively adapted Nick's protocol, including um, coffee enemas, in a way that is not consistent from the, the initial protocol to the lived life protocol, right? So in Vital Mind Reset, um, you begin to explore enemas and the recommendation is typically once a day for a month. And then most of my patients do enemas for years and years and years every day. Um, I myself did that for a period of time and now I do enemas twice a week. Uh, his recommendation was to take multiple supplements for the rest of your life. Uh, my recommendation is typically that supplements can be helpful after a supplement free reset and then for a period of time, maybe depending on if you're coming off of medications, etc., maybe two to four years, and then maybe they're not as necessary or maybe you work more intuitively with them over time. And his recommendation was that diet um, be the same. You know, this is your diet for your lifetime. And I have noticed uh, over time that there has been some complexity and nuance introduced to my own relationship to food. And uh, I believe that a lot of that has to do with invoking the spiritual dimensions of nutrition. So what I see is that there may be some sort of a process that helps us to understand um, that nutrition and eating is a, uh, is a journey. And that maybe at some point, because of the way we're enculturated to be really divorced from the land, divorced from um, our own self-nourishment, you're eating McDonald's and you're shopping at, you know, big box supermarkets and you're just eating to not be hungry, right? Or maybe you're eating to soothe some uncomfortable emotions. And then you discover, you know, some protocol or some advice or some guidance and it feels resonant so then you start to become more conscious about your consumerism, right? So that would be the vital mind reset kind of moment, right? You walk through this door, you can never walk back, right? Because now you know that it matters whether your beef is grass fed, uh, whether your eggs are pastured, it matters whether you have a hundred ingredients on your package or not. Um, and that portal is life-changing because it's the beginning of the end of the lie that you cannot heal yourself, right? And so maybe that's a part of taking the wheel and beginning to access the healing power of nutrition. You start to learn how to cook simple meals. You start to commit to boundaries in your, uh, you know, in your consumption. You know, 11 or so years ago, I went off of gluten and dairy, have not touched it since. And there is a point at which it's no longer a deprivation at all. It, it just, actually is a form of freedom, right? It actually feels freer. And, you know, that's true for coffee for me, for example, and their sugar is more complicated, um, you know, battle, I would say. However, um, I feel freer without it for sure, right? So that's the metric is, is not to engage that depri deprivation resonance, but instead to begin to explore a relationship to self-sustenance that feels empowering, liberating, exciting, and like it's a remembrance of something that you once knew that you forgot, right? And so my personal journey has now come to a place where uh, because of my cat Mushu uh, and our subsequent kitty, uh, who's named Biddy, and now the eight chickens um, that we have free ranging when the cats are not outside <laughs> in our yard, um, after a long, you know, uh, window of time where I was, you know, so immersed in workaholism that the idea of a pet was just anathema to anything that I could even imagine valuing. Um, now I'm beginning to be spiritually sensitized to what it is um, to interact with an animal, with another being, 
as a commodity, right? And no matter how nicely you treat them. And um, I have a friend who has uh, cats. And, and I, I said, you know, end of times, would you eat your cats? And she said, yeah, I would. And I thought, okay, I wouldn't. I would starve instead and, or access breatharianism or something like that. Um, I wouldn't. And that does not make me a better person or a worse person. It's just something I have to begin to become coherent around. And so coherence is the only uh, really meaningful striving here is to begin to do what we say and say what we do, right? So I became really sensitized to the, the soul. And I remember, you know, there was one night and I prepared some kind of beef dish as I do. And uh, our little kitty was sitting on the table because they do that. And she just looked into my eyes and I was just seized like in my heart. I could cry thinking about it. Um, by how much, how beautiful her soul is. Like she's got so much soul and those eyes just staring deeply into mine. And I thought about this animal, you know, that was on my plate and how impossible it was that this animal had less soul, less personality, less preferences, less, you know, um, maybe even joie de vivre, like less of any of that. No, of course that's not true we've just been enculturated to not think about it um and that makes sense for a period of time i really do and and what i've come to sort of conclude is at least preliminarily is that when you are at a certain stage in your healing and things are kind of becoming clearer you borrow the maybe pranic energy vital force energy but maybe even the literal hormonal, you know, glandular energy in the form of, you know, certain stress hormones, etc., from these animals. And it's actually necessary, seemingly, for the healing journey for some. And it confers a great gift. And if we can do it with reverence and a sense of sacredness, uh, and I often invoke my understanding of Native American, um, relationship, you know, to animal eating, then it can carry us to a point at, at which hopefully we've begun to liberate enough of our vital force from our trauma spaces, from our, you know, um, you know, from our spaces of imbalance in the body physiology, that it's less and less necessary. And, you know, there were a couple of months this summer where because of this sensitization I'm experiencing, I really just didn't feel like eating meat. And by the end of the second month, it was particularly, as we all know, um, challenging time. I felt super tired and super foggy. And if there's one symptom that's very challenging to me, it's any degree of fogginess in my brain. You can probably imagine why, because that's where my whole defensive structure um, inhabits. And I sort of thought, okay, I'm not quite ready yet. And so I'm going to work with this process and continue to explore, um, you know, what is best for me now and what feels coherent and what feels, what feels good. And so maybe over time, you know, it does begin to make sense that moving more and more towards plants um, feels coherent with an observation that we are indeed um, looking in the mirror of, you know, enslavement, domestication, and hierarchical control, right? So whether it's CAFO raised animals, which we all can agree is unethical and is not a form of food that anyone should be consuming. Um, but what if it's just a, a big farm, you know, that's like a local farm, or what if it's your backyard farm? Um, how does that work? You know, you keep these animals, you take care of them, maybe even you love them. And then, you know, one day um, they're on your plate. That may make a lot of sense. And I know it makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. And I completely honor that um, because I do think that this is a highly personal process and that dogma on both sides of the aisle is so, um, so much a reflection of unexamined shadow material. And 
that's why I've tried my best to just default to the outcomes uh, without some sort of like philosophical or um, ethical framework to my work and the dietary recommendations that I've made. Um, but I do think that it's possible that, you know, there, there can be an evolution. I know even with the garden that I have, I'll tell you that even when I, I harvest the plants, there's some part of me that's like, oh, God, <laughs> this grew for two months, you know, for me to have a salad. You know, it can get to the point, I think, where there is such an appreciation, such a consciousness, such a, an experience of gratitude for what it is to be nourished that isn't the mindless like eating in front of the computer that I did for many, many years in New York City. Um, and it's not to be rushed, right? Because then it would be just another attempt to be right and on the, on the good side of the equation. Um, but I do, I do find myself um, seeing in the current moment the possibility that the way that we treat animals, the way that we treat, um, you know, this earth, obviously, and even the way that we regard nourishment, that all of this is coming up for review. And that specifically, the, um, the enslavement framework around domesticated animals, and that would, you know, include our cats and dogs, um, certainly includes my kitchen, my <laughs> kitchens, my chickens that I, I let out, you know, of their cage. They have a cage and I don't want to have a cage. Um, I don't want to be enslaved, uh, taking crumbs of freedom from some master that ultimately seeks to figuratively or literally eat me. Uh, and so how can I become more coherent around that? And how can I see what steps I can take to really kind of, uh, step into the change that I want to see and resolve those uh, points of incoherence again that the whole sovereignty series is really about it's you know walking the walk um, and then there's walks after that walk right so yeah it's one thing to get off of my cell phone or get off of Amazon and then there's going to be whole other layers of really coming home to a way of living that wouldn't be possible if I wasn't also doing the spiritual work I believe of, you know, acquainting myself with my shadow, learning to love myself more deeply, and, and always using commitment and di discipline in service of self-discovery. So I wonder what you all think. Um, I certainly don't want to incite any sort of, uh, you know, vegan paleo wars. It's really not of interest to me, and I'm sure anyone else. Um, however, I do want to you know, sort of come on record, um, which I do in VMR also to describe that I think there is a path that opens up when you engage a protocol that has a huge healing field, uh, like Vital Mind Reset or another one like it. And you start to learn that you are in charge of these decisions. Your choices deeply affect uh, your experience of your body and well-being and that you can learn the language of your body and even your soul through um, you know through this daily experience of examining your preferences your intuition and allowing that to evolve not getting stuck um, because that itself is um, an important aspect of the freedom that we seek so thank you